This is what happens when an entire boat category scales faster than its quality control can keep up. Ribs became the fastest growing segment in recreational boating by offering something nobody else could, portability, performance, and price points that undercut fiberglass by half. But that affordability came with trade-offs that most buyers never saw coming. Right now, there are over 60 manufacturers building ribs for the North American market. 15 years ago, there were eight. That explosion in production created a race to the bottom on material costs, labor quality, and testing standards. The result? Boats that look identical but fail in completely different ways. What's actually holding your rib together? Which materials can handle ultraviolet exposure and which ones break down in 18 months? And why won't manufacturers tell you where their fabric actually comes from? Stick around, because this goes deeper than you think. Let's start with what a rigid inflatable boat, or RIB, actually is, because understanding the design helps you understand why they fail. A rigid inflatable boat combines a solid hull, usually fiberglass or aluminum, with inflatable tubes that run along the sides. Those tubes are not just flotation, they are structural. They determine how the boat handles, how much weight it can carry, and how it responds to impact. When the tubes fail, the boat does not just lose buoyancy, it loses integrity. The original RIBS were built in the 1960s for military and rescue work. The design made sense, you got the speed and rigidity of a hard hull, plus the stability and impact resistance of an inflatable. Early manufacturers like Zodiac and Avon used heavy-duty materials because these boats were going into combat zones and rough water rescues. Failure was not an option, so they were over-engineered and built with extra strength and redundancy. Fast forward to the 2010s, and ribs became a lifestyle product. Dealers started marketing them as the perfect beach boat, the ideal tender, the fun family runabout. Prices dropped, production moved overseas, and suddenly you could buy a 15-foot rib for the cost of a used jet ski. That's when the problem started. Here is the issue. Rigid inflatable boat construction requires precision. The tubes are made from multiple layers of fabric coated with materials like hypalon, PVC, or polyurethane. Those layers are glued together with specific adhesives under controlled temperature and pressure. If any part of that process is rushed, inconsistent, or done with inferior materials, the bond can fail. When the bond fails, the tube delaminates. The outer layer separates from the inner layer, air escapes, and the boat collapses. Delamination is the number one failure mode in cheap, rigid, inflatable boats, and it is almost always invisible until it happens. You cannot see it during a pre-purchase inspection. You cannot feel it when you are running the boat. It typically shows up as a bulge, a soft spot, or a sudden loss of pressure, usually when you are miles from shore. So what causes delamination? Let's break it down. First, material quality. Real Hippolon, which is a trademark name for chlorosulfonated polyethylene, is expensive and hard to source. It is UV resistant, chemically stable, and maintains flexibility across a wide temperature range. But it costs three to four times more than PVC. So manufacturers started substituting. They would use a thin hypalon outer layer over a PVC core, then market it as a hypalon boat. Technically true, functionally misleading. PVC is cheaper, easier to work with, and perfectly fine for certain applications. But it does not handle UV exposure the same way. It gets brittle. It cracks. When it is bonded to dissimilar materials, the adhesive breaks down faster because the layers expand and contract at different rates. You end up with internal stress points that weaken over time. Then there's the adhesive itself. High-quality, rigid, inflatable boat construction uses two-part polyurethane adhesives that cure under heat and pressure. The process is slow and expensive. Budget manufacturers use contact cement or single-part adhesives that set faster, but they create weaker bonds. Those bonds might hold in the factory, and they might even hold for the first season, but they do not survive thermal cycling, saltwater exposure, and flex stress. And let's talk about flex stress because this is where user behavior meets design limits. Ribs are designed to flex. The tubes compress and expand as the boat moves through the water. That is part of how they absorb impact. But excessive flexing, like what happens when you overload the boat or run it in conditions it was not rated for, accelerates adhesive failure. 
Every time a tube flexes beyond its design limit, it creates micro tears in the bond. Do that enough times, and the layers separate. This brings us to the Chinese manufacturing boom. Starting around 2015, factories in China began producing ribs at scale for export markets. They could build a boat for a fraction of what European or American manufacturers charged, and they flooded the market. Some of these factories were legitimate operations with quality control. Many were not. The problem with offshore manufacturing isn't the location, it's the lack of oversight. There is no standardized testing requirement for rigid inflatable boats in most countries. In the United States, the Coast Guard regulates flotation and capacity, but they do not certify construction methods or materials. In Europe, CE marking is supposed to ensure safety standards, but it is self-certified. Manufacturers test their own boats and issue their own compliance statements. There is no independent verification unless something goes catastrophically wrong. So what you get is a market where a $2,000 rigid inflatable boat and a $20,000 rigid inflatable boat can look nearly identical, but one is built with laminated PVC and contact cement, and the other uses bonded hypalon with welded seams. The buyer has no way to know the difference without cutting the boat apart. Let's look at some real-world failures. In 2022, a rental operation in Florida had three rigid inflatable boats experience catastrophic collar failure within a six-month period. All three boats were under two years old. All three were Chinese-made models marketed as commercial-grade Hypalon. When the failed tubes were sent for analysis, analysts found PVC cores with a Hypalon coating less than half a millimeter thick. The adhesive had degraded from heat exposure, and the seams had started separating at the stress points near the bow. Another case from 2023 involved a private owner in California. He bought a rigid inflatable boat called a rib from a well-known online retailer. He used it fewer than 50 hours and stored it properly under a cover. During a routine trip in calm water, the starboard tube developed a bulge the size of a basketball. The outer layer had completely separated from the inner layer. When he contacted the manufacturer, they claimed it was impact damage and voided the warranty. He had the tube analyzed independently. An independent analysis found it was a manufacturing defect. The adhesive had never properly cured. These are not isolated incidents. Insurance data shows that RIB claims for structural failure have been climbing steadily since 2019. The increase correlates directly with the surge in low-cost imports. And here is the thing. Most of these failures are unreported. They get settled quietly, the boat gets scrapped, and the buyer moves on. There is no central database tracking RIB failures. There is no recall system. The information stays fragmented. Now let's talk about what cheap actually means in this context, because price alone does not tell the whole story. A rigid inflatable boat, often called a RIB, can be inexpensive because the manufacturer is efficient, sources materials in bulk, or operates in a low-cost region. That can be a legitimate advantage. The problem comes when cost-cutting happens in ways that compromise safety. One of the biggest red flags is unclear material sourcing. If a manufacturer will not tell you exactly what fabric they are using, where it comes from, and how it is tested, that is a problem. Legitimate builders will provide material certifications, thickness specifications, and seam strength data. Budget manufacturers use vague terms like marine-grade PVC or military-spec fabric without backing it up. Another warning sign is warranty language. Look at what is actually covered. A lot of cheap ribs come with warranties that exclude the tubes entirely or only cover manufacturing defects for 90 days. If the manufacturer is not confident enough to stand behind their product for at least two years, that tells you something about expected lifespan. Then there is construction method. Hand-glued seams are cheaper and faster than welded seams, but they are also weaker. High-frequency welding creates a molecular bond that is stronger than the material itself. Glued seams are only as good as the adhesive and the skill of the person applying it. If you are buying a rib, and the manufacturer cannot tell you whether the seams are welded or glued, walk away. Let us address the certification question because this confuses a lot of buyers. In the US, the National Marine Manufacturers Association has voluntary standards for rib construction, but compliance is optional. The American Boat and Yacht Council publishes guidelines, but again, they are not enforceable. 
What that means is that any manufacturer can build a rib to whatever standard they want, as long as it meets basic Coast Guard flotation requirements. In Europe, the CE marking is supposed to indicate compliance with safety directives, but it is not a guarantee of quality. The manufacturer self-certifies. They run the tests, compile the documentation, and affix the mark. There is no third-party oversight unless a boat fails and triggers an investigation, so that CE mark on your Chinese-made rib might be legitimate. It might not be. You have no way to verify it. This is why independent testing matters. Organizations like the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators and the European Boating Industry do conduct some testing, but it is limited in scope and does not cover every model on the market. Most ribs never see independent verification. So how do you protect yourself as a buyer? First, research the manufacturer. How long have they been in business? Do they have a reputation in the industry? Are there user reviews from people who have owned the boat for more than one season? New manufacturers are not necessarily bad, but established companies with track records are lower risk. Second, ask specific questions about materials. What fabric is used? What is the thickness? Is it laminated or coated? What adhesive is used? How are the seams constructed? If the dealer cannot answer these questions or gives vague responses, that is a red flag. Third, inspect the boat carefully before purchase. Look at the seams. They should be clean, uniform, and consistent. Check for any unevenness, puckering, or discoloration. Press on the tubes. They should feel firm and uniform with no soft spots or variations in texture. If the boat is used, look for signs of early delamination such as bulges, wrinkles, or areas where the fabric feels loose. Fourth, understand the warranty and what it actually covers. A good warranty should cover the tubes for at least three years and include labor for repairs. It should clearly define what constitutes a defect versus normal wear and tear, and it should be backed by a company that will still exist in three years. Fifth, consider where you are buying from. Buying direct from overseas manufacturers might save you money up front, but if something goes wrong, you have limited recourse. Buying from a domestic dealer means you have someone local who can help with warranty claims, repairs, and support. Now, are all cheap ribs bad? No, there are budget-friendly manufacturers who build quality boats by optimizing production and keeping overhead low, but you need to do the research to separate the good from the bad. Price is a factor, but it is not the only factor. What about repairs? Can a delaminated tube be fixed? Sometimes. If the delamination is small and localized, a skilled repair shop can cut out the damaged section, prep the surfaces, and re-glue it. But if the delamination is widespread or if the underlying material has degraded, the tube needs to be replaced. And tube replacement is not cheap. Depending on the size of the boat, you are looking at between $2,000 and $8,000 for a full re-tube. Some owners try do-it-yourself, Repairs with patch kits designed for inflatables. These can work for small punctures or abrasions, but they will not fix delamination. The problem is not on the surface, it is internal. You need access to both sides of the material and proper adhesive to create a lasting repair. Prevention is a lot cheaper than repair. Proper maintenance extends tube life significantly. Rinse the boat with fresh water after every use, especially in salt water. UV exposure is the biggest enemy of inflatable fabrics, so store the boat covered or indoors when not in use. Keep the tubes inflated to the correct pressure. Underinflation causes excessive flexing. Overinflation stresses the seams. Avoid dragging the boat across rough surfaces. Those scratches and scuffs might seem minor, but they create entry points for water and UV damage. Use a proper trailer or cradle that supports the hull without putting pressure on the tubes. Let us talk about the regulatory side because there is movement happening here. In 2023, the European Union proposed new safety standards specifically for rigid inflatable boats, including mandatory third-party testing of materials and construction methods. The proposal is still working through the system, but if it passes, it would be the first enforceable regulation of its kind. In the United States, there has been discussion at the Coast Guard level about updating flotation standards to include construction quality, but nothing has been formalized. The challenge is enforcement. The Coast Guard does not have the resources to inspect every imported boat, and they rely heavily on manufacturer self-certification. What would meaningful regulation look like? 
It would require independent testing of tube materials and seam strength. It would mandate clear labeling of fabric type, thickness, and country of origin. It would create a public database of failures and recalls, and it would establish minimum warranty standards that manufacturers have to meet. Until that happens, the burden is on the buyer to be informed and selective. Here is the bottom line. Ribs are excellent boats when they are built correctly. They are versatile, stable, and efficient. But the market has been flooded with poorly made products that look legitimate until they fail. The difference between a quality rib and a dangerous one often comes down to materials and construction methods you cannot see without cutting the boat apart. If you are shopping for a rib, take your time. Ask the hard questions. Inspect carefully. Do not assume that a low price means you are getting a deal. Sometimes it means you are getting exactly what you paid for, a boat that will last one or two seasons before it starts coming apart. The rib market is not going to regulate itself. Manufacturers will keep cutting corners as long as buyers keep accepting vague answers and trusting marketing claims. The only way this changes is if buyers demand transparency, hold manufacturers accountable, and walk away from products that do not meet basic quality standards. These boats can be safe, they can last decades, but only if they are built right. And right now, too many of them are not.